So thanks so much for coming. Um, before we start, we just have to do our perfunctory disclaimer, uh, which is that the views we express today are our own views and they do not reflect the view of the commission, the commissioners or the staff. Um, and I would also like to suggest that uh, I've come up with a few topics that I think will be interesting to discuss today. But if you have questions, we're definitely open to it and it would make my job much easier. And so please feel free to interject or I'll leave some time at the end for questions. Um, so we'll start by introducing ourselves. Eugene, do you want to kick us off? Sure. My name is Eugene Orlov. I'm a financial economist at the Office of Litigation Economics in the Division of Economic and Research Anal in Risk Analysis at the SEC. Uh, I joined uh, DR a year ago from private sector where I work mostly on antitrust issues. Hi, my name is Matthew Winner. I am a visiting scholar in OLE. I joined a year ago. I'm at University of Illinois at Chicago and I'm based in DC. My name is uh, Eugene Kangels. Uh, I'm also an OLE. I've been there for about 10 years. Before that, I was uh, for some point time in academics and then some time in the private sector. And I am Aaron Smith, and I uh, joined OLE for the, or I joined the SEC for the second time two years ago, and I'm now with the Office of Litigation Economics, uh, which is what OLE stands for. Um, so I thought one way to kick things off would just be to provide some context to you about the type of work we do uh, so that you kind of understand where we're coming from for throughout the discussion. So Matt, yeah. you are on vacation from academia with us. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, so do you, uh, do you wanna maybe explain the group by way of how your job right now is different from- Yeah, certainly, certainly. So. <clears throat> Probably uh, the easiest way to describe academia is before tenure and after tenure. And before tenure, your only focus is on tenure. So whatever specific area of expertise that you're trying to have the field acknowledge you in is pretty much your life. That's what you live and breathe. If you do corporate, that could mean that you're an expert on executive compensation or M&A or boards. If you do asset pricing, that could mean you're an expert on liquidity or international markets or Q theory. There's a very specific thing that you want to be known for. And probably the biggest difference between my experience in academia and my experience in OLE, uh, as an aside, we do use a lot of acronyms. That is different working with the governments. <laughs> Tons of acronyms. Anyway, um, part of the thing that I would say is very different is going from that very narrow focus and very narrow cast in terms of scholarship and also in terms of scholarly execution and dropping in from a thousand feet to a very ground level, rudimentary, fundamental economic analysis on so many different interesting questions. It's just, it's, it's, it's like a night and day experience. You go from essentially working in your office on the two or three areas of research that drive you to potentially working on two or three cases within a week that are all different and all require you to put on a different hat and to think differently and to think critically. Um, so that's sort of like the fundamental difference, I would say, between my experience within academia and my experience this far in OLE is going from a very narrow focus to something that I don't want to describe it as uh, as sort of like a, a broad focus, because it's not that it's very broad. These are all financial cases. It's just that financial markets function in so many different ways and dysfunction in so many different ways. So you really have a variety of things that you get to work on and you get to feel like your work has meaning and has value because you're answering these very tough questions. Yeah, I, I can echo the meaning uh, part because the turnaround time is much quicker. So unlike the publication, like years and years, half a decade spent trying to publish a paper, you get feedback right away on the analysis mm -hmm. you do, which is refreshing. Uh, so Eugene, yes. you, you can provide the uh, private practice perspective and uh, it's the same, but you work for the bad guys? For the bad guys? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that pretty much sums it up. But, yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, I do wanna take a minute and step back and explain to the audience that our office, OLE, is dealing okay. with, kind of, we're supporting the division of enforcement within the SEC 
And that division brings in cases of uh, fraudulent behavior in the markets, and they investigate it, and we're helping them by providing economic analysis mm -hmm. and expertise. And in that regard, our work is actually very similar to the private, uh, private sector work that I've done, which was uh, litigation, economics, or economic consulting. A uh, big difference, mm -hmm. I think, is work-life balance. <laughs> and another big difference is really the, I think, the mission of the of what we do because at the SEC and and the OLE we're tasked with protecting the consumers, protecting the investors, and isn't that what you're supposed to do in antitrust? <clears throat> uh, <laughs> so going back to what I was talking about, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's 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 uh, like for me personally, it's it's really um, and um, a different type of work in the sense of that you know that you're helping people and and I think we'll talk about it in a little bit about like particular types of cases <laughs> where it comes up and uh, where um, you actually do know that what you do makes a difference for investors very good so thank you yeah. um, Eugene probably you're the best position to answer that question but I'm not gonna ask it we're gonna move on <laughs> uh, so all right <laughs> Uh, so I think uh, one of the things that I like quite a bit about this job is that unlike in academics where uh, you kind of come from this ivory tower perspective, we get a sense of the actual conduct that occurs in financial markets. And a lot of times that conduct, I think, is not um, adequately captured or it's captured with a long delay. And for me, uh, the height of this are kind of crimes against the basket of like crimes against retail investors. I think for a number of reasons, uh, we don't do a very good job understanding retail investors' incentives and their motivations. Uh, and you might think that that's because, like, securities offering fraud, like, uh, you know, somebody comes and says, hey, I've got a plan to turn dirt into gold. You would think, as an academic, nobody's going to give them money, but it turns out that they do. Mm -hmm. This is surprising to me. Uh, and so, uh, just by way of example, I think these things can be quite large in magnitude. So earlier this month, there's a cryptocurrency called Tether. It's like a fixed exchange rate cryptocurrency. And a group of investors filed a complaint against Tether, uh, arguing that it was part fraud, part pump and dump, and part money laundering. All of those three things, I think, do not uh, feature very prominently in our models. And so... Um, the, they're asserting damages of a staggering $1.4 trillion, which I think is uh, enough to actually impact market outcomes. And so really the puzzle from my perspective is why, why are we missing it? Why are we ignoring it? Um, and Matt, you have some background with behavioral yeah, finance sure. and retail investors. I thought you could yeah, maybe definitely. reflect so, on this. To kind of provide a bit of background, um, my area of research is behavioral and international. And one of the things that I feel like we uh, struggle with oftentimes as economists is the notion of economic magnitude and economic importance. Who's economically important? Who's the marginal investor? Typically, when we think about the marginal investor, most of our models will think of someone who's relatively sophisticated. So we think of an arbitrager who comes into the market, takes advantage of this pricing and puts prices back to an efficient outcome. But oftentimes, we don't really think about those market participants being people. And people can be duped, people can be misled, people have trust, people have affinity, people want to trust people that they believe are actually good. There's a whole literature on the way that our brains process trust and what that means for our financial decisions. So one of the things that I feel like we sometimes struggle with from an academic perspective is all of these investors are investors. It's still large amounts of capital that are being removed from their portfolio based on the actions of people who are doing these very devious things. Um, so I feel like sometimes we struggle as academics because our models focus on financial sophistication in such a way that we kind of disavow all of these market participants who are economically meaningful and important and are consistently taken advantage of even uh, in, in ways that hopefully we'll get a chance to get into. So what's the fix? What's the fix? <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, I, I would say probably two things. One is that 
it's maybe a little bit sappy to say, but I think this is actually a really good panel, just to the extent that so much of the work is a bit invisible to a lot of us as academics. So if you don't actually know that there are, if you don't actually know that investor protection and the, um, the misalignment between what's being offered and what's actually being provided is important and is something that regulators are actually enforcing on, that hopefully can spark at least some of you all to think of it about think about it in your research and think about ways that you can incorporate it. Um, the other thing that I think is kind of a fix or would be a potential fix, but who knows, is just data. Um, a lot of times, a lot of our questions that we answer are predicated on the availability of the data that we have. So your hands are bound by the sets that you have in front of you or the sets that you have uh, access to at your university. Um, so hopefully as we have more data that becomes available about some of the uh, different offerings that retail investors are very heavily involved in, like OTC and then also um, direct ownership, as more of this data becomes prevalently used and available, hopefully the scholarship can kind of catch up to the state of the art. Yeah, I think it, it seems like one of the tools that gets used is some kind of like financial innovation uh, like I found this this really clever way of uh, giving you a sure thing return on your money, and it'll be some kind of trick because of structuring something in a funny way. And I, I think Eugene, you've thought a lot about some of these products. Um, they're they're like um, linked notes, so like a corporate debt that is linked to some uh, some type of underlying value. That they seem to banks seem to have a lot of success placing these with retail investors, and uh, is this the yeah. same right to you? Yeah, so I think when I think about retail investment issues, there are really two key words that describe the issues. One is uh, suitability, the other is disclosure. And so, for instance, in the disclosure issue, um, I think what we've seen is we see uh, kind of complex products being sold to retail investors, put, uh, principal protected note, index linked uh, notes, uh, interest rates, deepeners, all kind of weird products that are sold to investors. Um, I think what, uh, what you saw was uh, those products in the, in, the early, in the early period when those products came out, a lot of fee, uh, fees were essentially hidden in the prospectus and were very hard, it was very hard for uh, retail investors to, to figure out what, what is actually, what am I paying in order to invest for, for this. Um, what you see now actually in a lot of these products is right at the front page, on the bottom of the front page you see, oh, I'm paying uh, essentially 8% to buy, buy this thing. There's some, on the, on the, a lot of them have on right at the front page at the bottom, this thing that you're buying for a thousand is really worth uh, uh, only uh, nine hundred uh, dollars or something like that, um, and it turns out that they're still being sold. And so the real puzzle is, for 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 me personally, it's like okay, now we uh, there is a real issue bringing a disclosure case because right at the front page, you're you're telling your client uh, that it's it's going to cost you this much. And yet it seems that these fees are uh, extremely high. And so my, my question to the academic community is a kind of competition. Where, where, why are these fees so high? Should they be this high? Is there a lack of competition? What, what is going on here? Uh, because it's actually hard to, uh, to, to, to say that there's a kind of a violation of law. So it's on you, audience, to come up with the answer. All right. Um, so Eugene, you're coming from IO perspective. We probably take many things for granted. Uh, what, what types of cases have kind of struck you as surprising or? Uh, yeah, I'll give it one example of a case that I haven't come across while working in, in the IO. And it kind of goes back to, um, well, it's all related to fraud. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of explain, uh, when, when I joined, like I, I, I was asked to work on a few cases, so-called cherry picking cases, and I'll explain what they are. Uh, that really surprised me <laughs> that it's actually happening. So, so if you think about like investment, investment advisor, right? So 
like as investors, as individual investors, you can ask an investment advisor to um, basically invest your money, right? To delegate that authority to someone to uh, operate on your behalf, right? And if an, if an investment advisor has multiple client accounts that he, he or she is working with, uh, there is a way for them, they can have an omnibus account uh, and they can do block purchasing into that account. So they, they instead of trading an individual account, they're buying like a whole block of like Apple stock. And then they, afterwards they can allocate portions of that purchase into individual clients account, right? So far so good. Now, nothing prevents the investment advisor from having their own account, right? And also like allocating part of that block purchase into their own account. And I think there's a regulation that that allocation should happen within a day. And what's, what's happening, and I wasn't aware about, is that some of the investment uh, advisors, they observe the performance of the stock price over the course of the day, and then they allocate sometimes disproportionately the winning kind of the winning stocks into their own accounts and losing stocks into the client's account right and if that's happening on a consistent basis that's like cherry picking and that's illegal obviously and as, as an individual as a retail investor like I would never know that like my returns are actually not really representing the, the market return right that there is this cherry picking going on but as a SEC economist, if we're asked to help the division of enforcement, we actually can analyze how random that allocation happens, right? If there is non-random component, we can do statistical analysis that compares the returns on the investor, investor advisor's own account with the returns on, on the client's accounts. And then we can see if it was allocated by chance or not, right? And to kind of prevent, um, so, sorry, before I, so that was like stunning to me that it's actually happening. Agreed, it, <laughs> it was really surprising to me too. Right, yeah. but to prevent <clears throat> um, maybe an, a question from the audience, at the SEC, like how we get knowledge of this kind of behavior happening in the market is there are multiple channels, including like whistleblowers. Uh, I think we have, at the SEC, we have a monitoring system. And also I think broker dealers have monitoring systems that they report to the SEC. And that's kind of how we get to work on these kind of cases, which is again, like interesting and surprising at the same time. Right. So, uh, so does it seem to you, Eugene, like there, like this type of case is like becoming more frequent or are there certain types that you think you've been, you've been around for the longest and. Yeah, so I think, I think you do see that certain changes in what what the enforcement division is is willing to bring. I think what you see is um, where the SEC is much more willing to bring big data cases. Um, uh, cherry picking tends to be a biggish data, not really big data, but as examples of big data cases uh, in the beginning of this month, actually. Uh, there was a big settlement uh, of against uh, Lack Securities. Uh, Lack Securities was essentially a broker that has assisted a trader in layering and spoofing cases. Uh, that's a, data, a really kind of complicated case for lawyers to bring, and it needs statistical economic kind of analysis. And, and you see those cases being brought. Another one. And they sent their data to us in one million separate text files. <laughs> yes, data is big. <laughs> um, another big data case, for instance, that uh, there was just a TRO. Uh, we just had a TRO against uh, SEC versus Chan et al., uh, which were Chan et al. Uh, was, were having a scheme where they were using trading on the lit market to manipulate the NBBO around and then uh, from those NBBO movements uh, being able to profit on the on the off exchange market. Uh, again, really kind of complicated case, uh, big data analysis. Those cases I think we're now we're willing to bring. Um, in terms of uh, cherry picking, it's actually a really good type of a case. An example of cases were very 
very regularly there's very little direct email evidence or whistleblowers or anything like that that gives direct uh, direct easy to understand evidence for a jury to say hey this 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 actually these guys knew what they were doing then they describe it right here in an email and so uh, those cases um, depend heavily on data analysis and statistical analysis to try to tell the story to the jury just from data uh, from the data, what's going on, and that that is that is actually pretty hard. I mean, it's easy to explain to a bunch of economists what's going on and say that the only reasonable explanation is cherry picking. It's actually hard to to tell that to a to a jury, uh, but we are bringing in those cases uh, regularly, and we we win them. Um, okay. So. Uh, relying on statistics, I guess, has has its own shortcomings. So it seems like this comes up quite a bit with um, with like firms that that disclose things in at times that are stri maybe strategically chosen, maybe not, to be timed with other disclosures. Um, and I think, Jenya, uh, you've thought about this a bit. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give a yeah. example of a case <laughs> and where uh, this actually comes up. Um, and where statistical analysis that we typically do actually doesn't apply, or we cannot really apply it. And one one case that I'm going to talk about is actually very probably simple, and probably everybody knows. It's event study analysis, which is um, you basically want to study the reaction of a stock price to an event, right? And very straightforward statistical analysis where you identify the event, you identify the window, the event window. And then you regress the stock price returns on an index returns, and you calculate the abnormal returns as a difference between uh, actual and expected returns, right? The problem is, like, it works if, if the event is well identified and there are no other, like, uh, well, it's well identified, it's not expected by the market, it's not anticipated by the market, and there's no other confounding information. So there are no other events happening at the same time. Well, it, it, ha it, 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 it actually often happens that the firms are being strategic, strategic about when they release bad news. And by that, I mean, they like, there's, I don't want to give like a, an example, but like if, if there was some misbehavior happening and they have to announce it to the market, they could actually wait until they also announce like earnings, let's say positive earnings, right? And they announce it on the same day and boom, like the stock price goes up. Maybe. So how do you disentangle the two? Well, there are like one, one way to do it, uh, which I personally haven't done, but I read about it is like if the announcements are within one day, but like in different times, right? Then you can try to do an intraday event study analysis, right? Uh, but what sometimes they announce everything in one letter, like to the market, right? Like 10 Q. I mean, yeah, it also raises the question of like how you choose when you start and stop. Right. And so you could be oh, yeah, like sort of cherry picking. Like other, yeah, there are a lot of <clears throat> other things that you have to think about. And so what we did uh, in, in our previous work is like sometimes, okay, so it happens in one day and, and at the same time. And instead, like, we, we're like, okay, let's not use sequence study analysis at all because we cannot disentangle the two events. And we actually turn to finance literature, right? So if we, if likely there is so much research uh, in going that studies the effect of different events on the stock price is that we would go and do a literature survey which analyzes the effect of the bad announcement on the stock price. And then we would just use that literature and maybe take a range of the estimates and then we'll work with that as, as, as a predictor of what would happen in our case. So, so this strikes me as, a, as like a pretty challenging thing to do because uh, it's a big population of lots of different types exactly, of disclosures yeah. that you're applying to one very idiosyncratic Absolutely, thing. yeah, it's, it's not a foolproof yeah. method, obviously. Like if, if, it's a, it's a, if it's a well studied event, a type of event, then we can kind of make an argument that it applies to our case, but obviously, like the the more random, sorry, the more rare the studies are, then like it's it, you make you have to make more assumptions about 
um, how to apply it to our case. And uh, there are a lot of caveats and assumptions that we have to make. Man. In the, but, but at some at some point, it's, it, it, in some regard, it's kind of like the best that we could do, that we can do in, in those cases. And as economists, we just have to do right. that and, and make those assumptions. Yeah, so that's a really important point is, um, I think oftentimes with research, there's an emphasis on presenting sort of your best findings, right. um, wanting to present the version of the truth that you find in your research that will be most compelling to a referee or to an associate editor. And it's different when you're trying to assess the actual truth, what actually happened in this case. Um, and so obviously you're going to still want to put your best foot forward and use as plain English as possible to explain to a, a group of non-economists what it is that actually did happen. But it's very different when you are tasked with protecting investors and wanting to know what actually happened in the market. And you kind of accept that there are going to be limitations, but that kind of comes with it. I also think that part of uh, what we don't think about as academics are just the significance of single firm event studies. We really don't kind of uh, have much of an appetite for that. A great example are bond event studies. If I told you that there are bond events, you would probably say, no, that's impossible. I, bonds are super illiquid and this and that. You tell me all these things that you know from papers, but from actual data, <laughs> actually studying them, it's fascinating. There are tons of movements that happen in bond markets that are priced and that are reflective of disclosures that you will see that actually occur. Um, as an aside. So uh, it seems like uh, the the single firm event study has taken some heat. Uh, um, like, and maybe this is partly related to the replication crisis and psychology and various concerns about p hacking. Um, but uh, at least at least the perception I have, Eugene, is is that there's. Uh, uh, this is popping up more and more, including in the legal literature and courts may, uh, I'm not sure if this is an inflection point or not, but in, in a recent, uh, it was an issue you, of the American statistician that you pointed out to me, the lead article called on statisticians everywhere to just scrap the term statistical significance from the jargon altogether. Uh, and I'm wondering whether you think this is um, something that, that's going to be sympathetic to the courts or... Uh, long way coming. Um, yeah, so uh, originally I'm trained as an econometrician, so there are certain kind of questions and event studies that are actually kind of really interesting to me. Um, I think for a long time uh, the courts clearly were overestimating what uh, single firm event studies could actually do, and particularly. Uh, they didn't recognize the kind of the low power uh, of, of those studies. You have daily price variation, order of magnitude one and a half, two percent. So you will never be able to pick, a, to, to pick up something like a 25 basis point movement. Seems 25 basis point movement is, matters to investors and, uh, and yet it will likely not be statistically significant. And so often those cases, uh, plaintiffs would never be able to win those cases because of materiality concerns. I think there does seem to be now some recognition coming into the courts that, okay, there, there are limitations with single form event studies, low power, a big one, confounding effects, another big one. Um, so, um, I don't know. If, did that answer your question quite? Well, do you think that the, the sort of standard will change or should it change? Is the American statistician right? So can we get a, do away with the term statistical significance? It actually turns out to be a really useful term for us. And I think <laughs> it's probably more appropriate to, to, to do away with it in academic literature with us. I think we... In litigation, we have we have a duty to prove something. We have to prove materiality. We have to uh, prove something, and so uh, I think statistical significance in that context is still a a reasonable criterion to say, yeah, no, now we now we have sufficient proof 
uh, that this, this news actually mattered to investors because we can observe a, a price impact. Within academic literature, I think, yeah, I would be more skeptical of the term statistical significance. Okay. So More attention to magnitude, sir. Yes, magnitude is important. <laughs> and, and I think various causal arguments that not everything uh, should depend on a single uh, t-statistic it, it should be argued in multiple different ways although arguably the causality stuff has gotten silly perhaps uh, <laughs> so eugene i think right after you started commissioner jackson had a speech and he called on D dira our division uh to basically bring some expertise from the IO field, uh, expertise about competition. And the, I think the nexus for this, this speech was really uh, the observation that it, a number of parts of the regulatory world have, or I guess the financial world, seem to be dominated by a few players. So in proxy voting, we have basically two proxy advisory firms. In credit ratings, we have three, maybe four, four three, three. Yeah, I think there are three. Uh, and I think one of the, the ones he was focusing on is the exchanges, which uh, I guess, according to The Economist, as of January 2019, 95% uh, of public trades were on exchanges that were run by just three companies. So NASDAQ, uh, the NYSE's parent company, ICE, and CBOE. Um, and so there has been, I guess, some push to potentially uh, think through the, the implications of this. So these exchange brokers have an obligation to execute trades at, at prices that are fair. To do that, they need data feeds from these exchanges. Uh, and the exchanges, I guess, have a lot of pricing power as a result of there being just three of them. So I think you have put some thought into, into this question and wondering if you want to reflect on how Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll 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 talk a little bit about it. Um, I've also so yes, I'm I'm by training a competition economist, and um, and so I'm I'm glad I'm also able to apply my knowledge at at, at, at the SEC, and that actually comes in. Uh, that expertise comes in um, as a, as a as a way to help um, not OLE but another um, kind of. Uh, mission of the SEC, but like rulemaking, like creating rules for the market, for the financial markets, and and the competition among exchanges in in that particular regard is actually like the key kind of component that we that we have to study and we have to analyze, right? So first of all, there are actually like thirteen exchanges if we think about the equities market, but there are only like. A lot of them are controlled by three. I think 12, 12 of them correct. are controlled. Twelve by of three. them are controlled by three parent companies. And three parent companies, and so while exchanges, independent of the rule that SEC is working on, come in and say, "Well, there's so much competition. There are like 13 exchanges. What are, what SEC are you talking about?" They kind of like conveniently forget that like the, the the parent companies are only like four, and one of them is IAX, which is like really small and kind of separate. Uh, one of those four, so it's really like as you mentioned, 95% of trade are controlled by those um, uh, three parent companies. And so I just want to mention like this, like in particular, like my, my own experience is I've been working at the SEC and uh, oh, helping uh, SEC like to study the, the market data access kind of component of the market. And in there, like we have to look at the competition among exchanges in different services or in different areas. And, and the complication here is that there, there are different degrees of competition or market power, depending how you look at it, depending on what you're looking at, right? So if you look at the execution services, at the trading services, well, you have exchanges that are 13 or four, depending how you look at them, but they're also like off exchanges venues like ATS, that, right? So the market participants, they have a choice where to trade, theoretically, right? And I'm not gonna qualify one way or the other whether there is market power or not, because that's, uh, I'm, I don't want to represent like <laughs> SEC to you, so not. But if you look, so uh, trading services is one kind of area. Listing services, can, right? Can I just back up? A source of confusion for me is why does the SEC have any say in in the fees? 
uh, in that the, are charged in the fees. Yeah, that these exchanges like what like what are we regulating here? It's, uh, well, one of the components is like, we are regulating fees because we, we were mandated by the we meaning SEC were mandated by the Congress to provide like fair execution of the of the of the trades and and the equal access, right? And so fees is part of that equal access. So we so we oversee ensuring equal access. Right. Some, okay. Yeah. And um, another type of, uh, another component for the competition is listing services, right? So here like ATSs, for example, are not part of that, right? So now you're back to 13 exchanges of four parents, right? Another one, connectivity, right? So all the broker dealers, they have to connect to the, uh, to the exchanges, right? So there's a different kind of market that you have to utilize in the competition. Another one is uh, what I'm working on is uh, market data access, right? So there is a like again mandated by the by the by Congress um, exchanges as, uh, providing um, the part of their data to I, I don't want to go into much detail but into like to uh, SIPs to consolidate those data and distribute to the to the industry, right? But on top of that, exchanges are also able to sell their own data as proprietary data feeds, right? And so there is also market for that. Or and like the, you could rent out like a computer in the exchange or something. Well, that's, yeah, that's kind of, a, <laughs> that's another component, yeah. Okay. So proprietary data feeds is really like they're selling like a lot of their own data on top of everything that's being provided through consolidated data feeds to the market. And that's like, so we have to study whether there is but whether there's market power in there or not, or there is a competition in there or not. So there's, it's, it's a very fascinating area, and I think it's, it's becoming more and more important. I mean, it's always been important, but like uh, it's, it's, it's important for the ACC, and we have to assure that there is equal access to trading data. And so these issues of competition are, I think, extremely important. And so yeah. um, like to satisfy Commissioner Jackson's call yeah. for competition <laughs> economists. Like, so I'm part of the uh, SEC, and I think we've 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 been hiring more uh, competition economists. Yeah, and I I just want to say that uh, Eugene's experience of having expertise that are tangential to another question that's being asked within inside the SEC, and being brought on to use that expertise and to help, and then also still doing court cases and things that are interesting and kind of fun to work on. It's part of the reason why OLE, uh, sorry to use acronyms, it's part of the reason why working in the group for the Office of Litigation Economics is incredibly fulfilling. Your, the, the hat that you put on as an economist based on your training and based on your expertise, you're still implementing that when necessary and in ways that are effective. And it's not at the cost of you basically getting exposure to all of these different kind of cases that otherwise you would have to work in the private sector on a different side with a different <laughs> mandate to kind of do. Yeah. So, so earlier, uh, Eugene brought up this this case of these retail products, and he mentioned competition as being one of the things that seems to be missing. So he can correct me if I'm wrong, but but my sense is that the puzzle is that you have some retail investor who's bought one of these w one of these products. They need cash for whatever reason. They'd like to sell it back, and uh, they get quoted prices that are that seem to be way too low. Uh, and it's like, why won't somebody else buy them at prices that are that are supposed to be fair? Um, do you do you have a sense of sort of? why it seems like the market is so segmented in some products? Um, I have not thought about it, to be honest. Yeah, and maybe it's, it's a discussion for another time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Unless- you Do you have thoughts? Have <laughs> um, not a whole lot. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, th I think the, 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 the two problems, I think. One is the original sale of those, those particular type of products. You have the original sale, the original uh, uh, to, the, to the retail client, and most of those products are held to maturity. And so there is no liquid secondary market to sell those things off. So you have I think you have both a 
also, and I don't know for sure, but I, I the the magnitude. I don't know what a reasonable markup for these products is when you originally sell them, but they look high to me. And so there seemed to be a competition problem, possibly at the right at the beginning, and then you seem to have possibly a competition problem in the in the secondary market. Or collusion. <laughs> That'd be interesting to study. Yeah, I was just that's uh, that's like one of the fundamental problems is that there is not a secondary market, so there's not liquidity that you access as an investor, and it's very difficult to value something if there's no market for it. Um, so, Eugene. Yes. I believe you have some thoughts on trends and cases, and whether we have big, big systemic issues in our. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, we were talk, talking yesterday just about what are new cases coming uh, coming to uh, that we're doing a lot, and so in the context of that, I thought, well, what are the type of cases that we're not doing anymore? And so when I originally started out in the consulting world and started working on finance cases, the, we in 2003 we had the mutual fund market timing cases 2006 you had the stock option backdating then you had the rmbs filled with crappy loans also known as a financial crisis yes the start of the financial <laughs> crisis um then you had liber um you had the uh, uh, the insider trading ring in new york that was going after and so what we haven't seen for a while the the the, the the common threat that seems to be happening in that type of case is an industry-wide problem that that lots of people know about, and we haven't seen actually for for quite a while, kind of that type of case where you have essentially something wrong in a, in, a, in the entire industry. And so I started thinking, why is that? Um, so it, it kind of stopped somewhere around 2010. And my first thought was, well, that's when you, when I joined the SEC, but that's probably not the explanation. <laughs> um, so, um, but it could be rela related. In 2010, uh, the SEC also started its whistleblower program, and whistleblowers now get a serious compensation if they if if they let uh, if the, let the SEC know know of problems in the market, and so it's possible that. What type, what type of compensation are we talking about? Uh, I think the largest whistleblower award was somewhere around $32 million. Um, so it's it's serious money if you can bring a good whistleblower case. So that, I think it's possible that, that it's just harder to have widespread industry-wide uh, kind of problems because because of our whistleblower program. But I don't know if that is ever... That's, Purely speculation at this point, and it might be an interesting research topic. I don't know, uh, but uh, but maybe that that the program is actually uh, effective. Famous last words, I guess. <laughs> um, so, would like to uh, see whether there's any questions from the audience. Um, Josh White, you've got something. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. How does a behavioralist point to the market and say it's efficient? Look, court, it's efficient. Yeah, that's fair. I, I think um, <laughs> I, I would say there's sort of uh, maybe two things that I want to articulate that are very different within this setting than our classic setting. So within our classic setting of doing economic analysis, if you think about the research questions that you have, uh, I don't know your specific area that you work in, but there's a lot of assumptions that we have to make as economists in order to even hit run on a regression. There's lots of things that we have to assume that are very general and apply to investors or apply to firms in order for us to actually have testable implications. And in the setting that we're in, oftentimes the focus is very, very, very narrow. And for this very, very narrow focus, we have access to information that you would never get 
You may know through emails what someone is intending. You may know through other activity that they're engaging in that this is also corroborative evidence of them intending to do X, Y, or Z. So there's a whole layer of information, a symmetry that we kind of um, have access to oftentimes that I think validates why you would then want to look at the market in this very uh, specific, narrow manner. I would also say that part of the arguments, because oftentimes in legal cases, uh, defense will make arguments countering market efficiency, like, oh, there's small small firms earn more that's not efficient so like it's really easy to to point to case it's really easy to point to evidence of general market inefficiency but that doesn't negate whether or not the market efficiently responded to a disclosure or if the market is efficiently responding to an event but, but, but it does seem kind of problematic like if you think that it, maybe there's some overreaction to news then all of a sudden all of our single firm event studies overstate everything. Yeah, and if you do think there's overreaction, then that's your obligation as an economist to make that incredibly clear to the lawyers you're dealing with on the case. That's sort of the way that I've internalized it. Like if, if there's something that I, if there's something that, to your point, feels like the market may have gotten this wrong, again, you're trying to find the truth in the matter. And if you can't find other corroborative evidence that would justify the economics of, uh, not materiality, but this, the economic significance or economic magnitudes of what it is that you're testing, then you don't really have much evidence of anything, which again is something you would want to communicate to the attorney on the case because we're trying to find the truth. Um, so it's a muddled answer, but you have access to information that you don't. And then you also have an obligation to be very clear on the limitations of what you're finding. Have something here. Yeah, just something that there is really practical concern for us is we do a single firm event study. The first day shows up statistically significant. The second day also shows up statistically significant. Uh, and we have no explanation of, of why that might be, except for um, apparently the event still matters. And I don't know where it comes from, whether it's, but essentially I think in the courts, the judges, are misinterpreting academic literature and say, no, no, markets these days are so efficient, news gets incorporated in a price within 10 minutes. Um, I don't know whether the academic community really believes that, but I do, probably not. But it, it's, it's clearly contradictory to, I think, uh, what what we see uh, what we see happening quite frequently, and it seems like in academics it's well recognized that um, you have invent, event induced volatility, which to me seems to indicate like, hey, apparently the 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 market is still evaluating whether the news matters or not, and um, and you can't just look at necessarily look at the first day in order to evaluate what the, what the total price reaction is. You do want to uh, think about what's happening in the second day. Um, so this this kind of efficiency in terms of yeah we have weak market the kind of weak efficiency of the correlation is probably gone after after like ten minutes or half an hour or something. But how long does it really? take for, for for all fundamental information to, to be incorporated in the prices. It's it's a hard question, but if, if again, if academics could give a clearer answer, I think courts would start to listen because right now they think it's uh, 10 minutes is enough. Not every court, but many courts. Do you want to jump back in? Are you satisfied? <laughs> <laughs> any, other, any other questions? I would give you an example, but the case is still ongoing, so I cannot. Uh, and I don't know if Eugene 
can jump because I'm still fairly new, so I don't have an example that I could share. But generally, like the the one that we've looked at is it was fairly well covered. Maybe not like widely covered, but it was covered in the in the academic literature. And uh, I, I don't want to like know that. We're being critical also when we look at the literature because paper quality, you know, can differ. And as, as Aaron mentioned, we also make sure, we want to make sure that it applies to our case, right? So whatever, whatever is being studied, like the industry or, or the time period, right? So you want to make sure that it's actually applicable, right? So there is no like other side, so like court saying, oh, that's totally in inapplicable, right? So. I mean, I guess I have an answer. Um, I think. I had an answer too. Yeah, <laughs> I know, but I was thinking of my answer. Okay. Uh, so it seems like one kind of, I guess, sticky point uh, at times can be whether, uh, if we penalize a company, whether the right people are paying that penalty. So, like the shareholders today versus uh, maybe maybe it was the executives that really benefited from some conduct. Um, and I think there isn't a ton of literature about kind of the the company response to um, sanctions and to investigations. And so I, that makes it hard to think about how effective like the SEC's deterrence policies are and whether uh, whether we're like we're sort of right to be concerned about who's getting charged what and um, right. <clears throat> Did you have something? Yeah, um, from the UK, and from an author from Great Britain, they had a very interesting case with a UK chemical parts company that really hit the news. It was a failure of the Wastewood Fund, which is three billion pounds. And some of the issues that you mentioned, the fees that you were charging on this fund, it was based on valuations, the right fees and valuations. Um, there was also lots of chatter about platforms that were pushing retail investors' money into this fund. And, and basically, it's these superstar managers in the big tech are really keeping their eye on what they're actually doing. And so there's been a lot of criticism of key disclosures to retail investors because this new fund was invested in lots of high-risk investments, lots of startups, lots of AI companies, high-tech companies. And similarly, the retail investors were not really getting And no one knows what any of the valuation yeah. stuff is worth anyway. <laughs> uh, I, I guess it's the, 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 are these issues on your radar? I think it, I, I don't, I, I guess I'll just add like an additional issue, which is it, it seems like sometimes it's hard to even figure out what the right disclosure is. Like a fund could say, we don't use leverage and then go and buy exclusively options. And, you know, I guess maybe they're not using leverage, but certainly has the effect of being levered. Um, I, I, I don't know, do, do you have any reflections? No, I, I guess the question is, are, are the types of funds, or are, I, I mean, I think it's on our radar, <laughs> as the, the quick answer. It should be. Right. And it really came to head last week because we investigated the journalist program as well. Hmm. It was on the BBC and people have started talking about it a lot. And there was another case, which kind of wasn't related, but it was a fund manager um, essentially doing what his own account. Hmm. So the fund was buying, I believe it was buying, or indirectly was buying. So it created quite a lot of bad publicity, I guess, in terms of what these funds are actually doing. Huh. So, like a sort of front running the fund or something personally. Hmm. Very interesting. 
Can I jump in with a side note? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Well, Uh, so cer certainly one additional factor would be capital formation. Um, so if all you cared about was investor protection, you wouldn't have very many companies raising money because you would just say, well, investor protection is paramount. So there's, a, there's obviously a tension there. Um, and I think the, I, I mean, it's, it's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but uh, you know, it seems like a balancing act that, that the commission is always trying to get right. And uh, I think another thing, maybe like in application to rulemaking, um, on top of capital formation, it's also efficiency, economic efficiency mm -hmm. is something that we definitely look at. So I know it's broadly defined, but it's, it's an analysis that we do that it's economically efficient. Yeah. I, I did want to jump in like with a side note on the, on the previous question is like SEC is tasked obviously with protecting investors in the, in the U.S. Right, but in in my experience, like in this working in the um, at the OLE in the last year, there is actually um, interest from the European regulators in the work that we do, and so they come and consult us, or maybe want us to share our experience of how we analyze certain types of cases, and so there is some kind of like cross in an effort to be more like us or well, I, I, I don't know but at least maybe learn something yeah. and uh, improve their processes yeah so which i find interesting and so uh on the off chance that maybe somebody here uh is ever interested in in moving into kind of litigation support eugene i thought maybe you could as being a somebody who hires for our group uh reflect a little bit on what you think makes uh, somebody successful in in this job, or what what could be kind of conversely not helpful. <laughs> uh, That's a good question. Um, so yeah, we we are hiring again, both uh, possibly for leave, certainly for Dira as a whole. Um, I'm best informed about the kind of the litigation work. So really, where where our group falls is kind of a bit halfway between private sector consulting and academics uh, with maybe more towards a tilt to private sector consulting so successful uh, private sector consultants doesn't necessarily have to be finance uh, but if, you, if you're just a good data analyst who can kind of apply common sense uh, interact with clients communicate complex ideas to uh, to uh, lawyers that is just a hugely valuable skill set um, uh, attention to detail. Um, I, th I think when I joined, uh, when I when I went from academics to private sector, uh, it was in private sector it's standard to do double coding, and it was very humbling to, uh, joining a private sector firm saying, "Oh, I screwed this up again." I mean, it's really like it's very hard to to uh, to do something right. So attention to detail. Uh, is, is usually important uh, for us. Um, we don't uh, we don't have that kind of narrow focus in academics, where you really have to be very good at one specific uh, uh, specific topic. We really need people who can kind of apply basic economic financial principles to pretty much any kind of litigation securities litigation that comes across. Um, so. Um, we do hire both from private sector consultings and as well as from academic market and it doesn't you don't have to be the most published person uh, in the world in order for a lead, but uh, we, we look for a certain type of skill set that's important for kind of consulting work so is the big picture thinker who's detail oriented <laughs> <laughs> yes I think that sounds right very good <laughs> one thing I also mention is that uh, as a group, the environment is very collaborative. Um, so when you hear of this, when 
when I hear you, Eugene's uh, tagline of like, you know, good with data, detail oriented, uh, good with the big picture, it, it can feel as an outsider a bit intimidating because obviously if you don't have experience in this area, then it's like, what in the world? How do you start? Um, but things are structured such that you're working in tandem, you're learning from people who have experience. It's very open, very communicative. And in terms of like a more general work environment for, uh, for the SEC, for DIRA, compared to academics, uh, academia, it's working at the SEC is way more women friendly. I've had way more women as colleagues and as bosses than I would ever experience in academia, which is lovely. Um, and obviously, as a person who's also a visible minority, working in an environment that's very, very welcoming and very diverse uh, ethnically and geographically, just all of it, it's, it's nice. It's a, it's a different experience. So that's not something that I think Eugene would necessarily uh, say about uh, the experience as the person who hires, but as the person who applies, it's something you notice. Um, all right. So earlier you mentioned big data cases. Uh, I believe there's a hacking case uh, where people might gain inside information via hacking and that this is maybe of increasing concern. Do you want to discuss that a bit? Uh, sure. So um, this is a case that uh, we started investigating five years ago. Uh, l last year, it f uh, went to trial. So this is uh, the Newswire hacking case. Uh, essentially, what happened was we had people in the Ukraine being able to hack into the computers of uh, the the Newswires, which are the the firms that distribute earnings news uh, to the market. So the big, three big ones are PR Newswire, Market Wire, and Business Wire. Uh, and the way it works is when a, when a firm has earnings news, they, they typically hire one of those three firms. They will uh, often upload their earnings news during the day, and then the, the Newswire service will wait until 4 o'clock, and then at 4, 4 one will essentially distribute this news. So the Ukrainian hackers uh, were able to get into those computers and so they get early access to these uh, to this earnings news uh, during trading hours. Obviously potentially very profitable. Um, so again this was a it was a difficult case to bring because this was done offshore uh, things were done through the dark web. Uh, there was very limited uh, kind of email evidence uh, between uh, people who were involved in the scheme. Uh, so it depended a lot on the kind of analysis of the data of what's going on here. Uh, so we, what we did was uh, we we assisted the uh, the enforcement division as well as the DOJ. Often the DOJ and the SEC have parallel cases, so this became a criminal case. Uh, we assisted the DOJ uh, analyzing data. Uh, it was about a million kind of trades around earnings news of about a thousand different uh, earnings events uh, and trying to figure out, uh, well, what's the evidence that these guys are actually involved in uh, the, these traders that, uh, that received access that seem to have gotten access, what, what's the evidence um, that they indeed were tra trading on this news that they early got. So um, it took a bit of time uh, to, to analyze this data. It, it became a, a, a contentious criminal trial. So literally you go through every share, a very tedious work, making sure you, you, you Track every little sh every share, every stock split, uh, ticker changes. Make sure that you can track everything because the other side is going to try to kill you on data quality. Um, 
but uh, but in the end it was successful we we uh, i actually testified in that case uh, the doj won the case so we have a criminal conviction against two of the traders the sec is settled with with many of the other people that were part of the scheme uh, total scheme where i think we now received about a hundred million dollars uh, back um so it was a fun case it was probably my most interesting case during my tenure there All right. Question? So you mentioned you testified in that case. Um, has it been recent to you that the SEC employees have been able to testify in cases? And what's your view on that? I mean, you're being paid by the person you're, you're representing, and maybe you're not, maybe you haven't testified because you haven't done your job. Do you think it's good that employees should be allowed to testify, or should they be using outside academic Um. Isn't, aren't the, the cornerstone experts also paid on, for, by the person that they're representing? <laughs> uh, I can, yeah. I can answer it. So, uh, so it's the people in, uh, in the Office of Litigation Economics have increasingly testified in federal courts, uh, sometimes as uh, so many witnesses, and sometimes as uh, experts. Uh, it's, it's, it's become acceptable. It, it used to be very hard within the SEC for uh, to hire an internal person. It has become more, more, uh, much more easy. I think the trade-off for an attorney is: do I hire a guy that seems independent, but then I pay him a thousand dollars an hour? So how much independence is there versus here is a guy that works in my my uh, my organization? Uh, but I don't pay him anything. They just get regular salary. And so that trade-off matters to trial attorneys a lot. Uh, and the trade-off is not obvious. Sometimes you want that independent expert. Um, but but what you see often, for instance, in the hacking case, uh, what you saw was when the defense expert comes on and uh, the, the first question on cross-examination is, what do you get per hour? And the guy has to say a thousand dollars per hour. You see the entire jury kind of oh, that. That sounds like a lot. Um, so, so the trade-off is not obvious. We, the SEC still hires mostly outside experts, but we we more and more testify as well. Do you, Do you think that uh, because we're doing more inside expert work, the I mean that ties up resources for investigations, right? Is there, is there much tension in terms of balancing? Um, let me be somewhat vague about it and just say we have a group of 30 people that support a thousand little lawyers. So we're somewhat uh, resource <laughs> constrained. Uh, could I, uh, sorry, could I add uh, for a second? Uh, yeah. uh, I think there is also, and Eugene, correct me if I'm wrong, there, like depending on the case, Within OLE, there is also independence is achieved that there may be like a, a, some economists doing the investigative work, and if the case goes into litigation, then it's a different set of economists who actually like take over and like maybe right. repeat the analysis and testify. So, so there is some kind of people who did the investigation are not involved in the outcome because they're like out of the picture, and so so it's almost like you're hiring an internal expert to do the work. So. Uh, so, the, so the, the question is uh, that attorneys aren't just thinking about about money; they're also thinking about kind of the expertise of the testifier and um, how how does that kind of play in with uh, being an internal uh, hire? Is that a fair character? Okay. And also quality. 
yeah. the quality of the person. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yes, it's uh, it's credibility. It's uh, your CV. It's prior testifying experience. It's it's a complicated trade-off for, for trial attorneys. Yeah, there's a certain type of cases uh, in which you just want to have an outside expert. For instance, in layering and spoofing cases, you uh, generally you want uh, a, an academic expert who can explain exactly how this how this market manipulation might work and uh, um, so I think our internal expert uh, testimony is often a bit more even if when we when we testify as experts it's more a bit towards the summary expert work where you say hey this this is how you should look at the data um, Yeah, what well, and there was that this that opinion, right? That kind of uh well I'll leave it. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, uh very much appreciate you coming. Thanks so much. All right. <clears throat>